All right, let's start chapter two, part two, by looking at number 34 here. So we're asked to solve this equation. Now when I'm trying to solve these equations, one of the strategies we could use is look to see if we can factor. And anytime we go to factor, the first step is to look to see is there greatest common factors. So I notice that each one of these terms are divisible by, or have an x in common, so I'm gonna factor an x out. When I do that, I'm left with six x squared plus x minus 12 equaling zero. Well, now this is one of those problems where I can't just look to see what two numbers multiply together to be negative 12 and what two numbers and same two numbers add together to be 1x. And the reason why is because we have an a value here that isn't 1. So this is one of those where we have to take 6 times negative 12 and get negative 72. So I'm looking for two values that multiply together to be negative 72x squared that add together to be 1x. And those two values would be 9x and negative 8x. Because if we multiply those together, we get negative 72x, and if we add those two together, we get 1x. So what I'm gonna do, I'm gonna go to the space, erase this. But I'm just gonna focus on this right now. We'll come back with that x in just a little bit. But to factor that down now, I'm just gonna write this now as four terms. So we'd have that 9x minus 8x that we came up with minus 12. Because if you notice, 9x minus 8x is 1x, which hasn't changed the value of anything, just changed how it looks. And now we're going to factor this by grouping. So I'm going to group together the first two terms and group together the last two terms. And from those first two terms, we can see that we have a greatest common factor of 3x, leaving me with, whoops, 2x plus 3. And then in the next two terms, I see that I can factor out a negative 4, leaving us with also 2x plus 3. So the common factor there between those two sets is 2x plus 3. What we're left with is 3x minus 4. Now i got to remember to include that x that we had at the beginning there. And remember, this would be equal to 0. So now we can set each factor equal to 0 to find the solutions for x. Remember, this is a cubic. There's going to be three solutions. And our solutions would be x equals 0. If I set this equal to 0, I would subtract 3 and divide by 2, which would give me negative 3 halves. If I set this equal to 0, I would add 4 and divide by 3. So we'd get 4 thirds. So those would be my three solutions for x. All right, let's look at number 35. In number 35 here, we have the square root of x plus 2 equals x minus 4. So the first thing I need to do is I need to get rid of the radical, so I'm going to square both sides. And when I square both sides, that means that we have x minus 4 times x minus 4, which if you FOIL that or if you use a box method, it doesn't matter to me. Either way, you're going to simplify that and get x squared minus 8x plus 16. And now we're going to approach this one just like we did number 34. So we're going to try to solve this by factoring. So I want to get this equal to 0. So I'm going to subtract, do a couple things. I'm going to subtract x from both sides. So that gives me minus 9x. And I'll subtract 2 from both sides. So that gives me plus 14. So now it's equal to 0. So now I'm trying to figure out what two numbers, because this is one where the a value here is 1. So we can do one of those where we look to see what two numbers multiply together to be a positive 14 that add together to be a negative 9. And that would be negative 2 and negative 7. So now I can just set each of those equal to 0 and solve. So if I set x minus 7 equal to 0, I get x equals 7. If I set this equal to 0, I get 2. Now the problem is, you all, for since we have a radical here, it makes things a little different. We want to make sure that you definitely check your answers for these. Now the previous ones, we could have checked our answers with just the intent of looking to see do our answers actually worked, did we make a mistake? But for this, we're not looking so much for a mistake, but we need to look for extraneous solutions. And so to check for an extraneous solution, if I put two in for x, I would get the square root of two plus two equals, equals two minus four. Well, two plus two is four, and the square root of that is two. And two minus four is negative two. Those don't equal each other, so that means that this is an extraneous solution. But the other solution works. If we put 7 in there, we'd have the square root of 7 plus 2. On the other side, 7 minus 4. 7 plus 2 is 9. The square root of 9 is 3. And 7 minus 4 is 3, so that checks. 
but 2 doesn't equal negative 2, so that's why 2 is an extraneous solution. All right. So to solve this one algebraically with absolute value, now with absolute value, remember that there's two things that we could put inside of absolute value that would give us 5. Okay, so what I'm going to do here is I'm just going to cover this up for a second. So inside of absolute value there, there's two things we could put in there that would give us 5. We could put 5 in there, the absolute value of 5 would be 5, and I could put negative 5 in there, and the absolute value of negative 5 would also be 5. So what does that tell us? Why, why do I say that? Well, that means that this piece here, 6 minus 4x, that could be 5, or 6 minus 4x could be negative 5. So in essence, when we solve an absolute value equation, we're going to set this up as two separate equations that we need to solve. Now, there's no absolute values here because, remember, we're looking to see what values would we need to put in for x that would give us 5 inside of absolute value, and what values would we put in here for x that would give us negative 5 inside the absolute value. So when you go to solve that, I'm going to subtract 6 from both sides. I do that, I get negative 4x equals negative 1. And so when I divide by negative 4, I get x is a positive 1 fourth. And for this one, do the same thing. I'm going to subtract uh, 6 from both sides. That gives me negative 11. Divide by negative 4, that gives me a positive 11 fourths. If you wanted to, you could check your answers, and you'd see that both of these do, in fact, work. All right, let's look at this one. So we're going to solve this inequality. So this is an inequality. So it's going to have, we're going to solve it very similar to the way that we did number 36. Because remember, there's two things that we could take the absolute value of to get 5, 5, and negative 5. So we would have one inequality. That's going to be 2x plus 1. But we're not going to have an equal sign. We're going to have an inequality sign. So it would be less than 5. Now the other one, we're going to change that to be a negative 5 which means we have to change the inequality as well. So now we're going to just solve these normally. So I'm going to subtract 1 and divide by 2, and I would get that x is going to be less than 2. For this one, I would subtract 1, get negative 6 on the right, divide by 2, I get negative 3. Now remember with inequalities, the only time you have to worry about switching the inequalities if we multiply or divide by a negative. I didn't do that here, just divided by positive, so that's why the inequality stayed the same as we work through it. Now, if we look at our, a number line, that's going to help us with our integral notation. So we have negative 3 and we have positive 2. So it's going to be greater than negative 3, but it's going to be less than 2. It's not equal to, so those would be open circles, so it's just going to be between negative 3 and 2. That would be our answer using interval notation. All right. So this one, they give us the reminder to look for extraneous solutions, but the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to look in their denominator there in the end to see if I can factor that down. And it can factor to be x minus 3 times x plus 2, because we look to see what two numbers multiply together to be negative x, or negative 6, that add together to be negative x. All right, so we're solving an equation here. We're not adding two fractions. We don't need to keep these in the, as fractions. I want to eliminate the fractions. So remember, to eliminate fractions, what we're going to do is we're going to multiply by our least common denominator. We're going to multiply everything by x minus 3 and x plus 2. So when I multiply, when I look at that first fraction, the x plus 2 and this x plus 2 would cancel each other out, leaving us with just the x minus 3 to be multiplied by that x, uh, the value for x there in the numerator. So we got rid of the fraction there for that first one. Okay, so let's go to the next one. So here, this x minus 3 and this x minus 3 would cancel each other out, leaving us with the x plus 2. So we would have 5 times x plus 2. And on the end here, the x minus 3 and x plus 2 would cancel out with everything here. So we left with just 25 on the right. So now in order for me to simplify this, I'm going to distribute the x and the 5 through. So that would give me x squared minus 3x plus 5x plus 10 equals 25. Now I'm going to get this equal to 0 and everything and combine like terms. So we'd have x squared negative 3x plus 5x would be 2x. If I subtract 25 from both sides, I get negative 15. So now I have it equal to 0. Okay, so now I'm going to factor this. So I'm going to look to see what two numbers multiply together to be negative 15 that add together to be 2. Well, that's going to be 5 and negative 3. So x plus 5 x minus 3. 
And then I'm going to set each of those factors equal to 0. And I get x equals negative 5 and x equals 3. Now remember, we have to check for extraneous solutions. So remember here at the beginning, the restrictions in our domain, the values that x can't equal, is x can't equal positive 3 and x can't equal negative 2. So if any of my solutions are part of those restrictions, those that or those solutions would be extraneous. So this one would be an extraneous solution. And this one would be a solution that actually works. All right, so we're going to have to find some different things. We're going to have to find the horizontal asymptotes, the vertical asymptotes, uh, any removable discontinuities, x-intercepts and y-intercepts. So there's a lot to find here for this one problem. All right, so the first thing I'm going to find is I'm going to figure out what are my horizontal asymptotes. So my horizontal asymptotes, remember, we get that when it's in standard form. So I'm going to look at that now before I do any factoring. So I notice that the leading term for both the numerator and the denominator are the same. So what's left over when I uh, cancel out those same uh, leading terms? We're left with 1 half. So the horizontal asymptote would be y equals 1 half. Remember the rules, if the denominator would be bigger than the numerator, then the horizontal asymptote would be at y equals 0. All right, vertical asymptotes. In order to find the vertical asymptotes and any holes in the graph, I'm going to have to factor the numerator and the denominator. Now, let's look at that denominator first, because there's nothing I can, there's no greatest common factor there. And I notice that my a value is at 1. So this is one of those where I'm going to have to do a little bit of work, so I'm going to do that work over here on the left. All right, so I'm going to look. I'm going to multiply these first two number and, and last two numbers, and I get 24x squared. So I'm going to look for two numbers that multiply together to be 24x squared and that add together to be that middle term, negative 11x. And that would be negative 3x and negative 8x. So I multiply those together, I get a positive 24x squared. If I add those together, I get a negative 11x. All right, so I'm going to rewrite this now with the, using those two terms in the middle. So we start with the 2x squared, but then we'd have negative 3x minus 8x, and we have plus 12. All right, so now I'm going to group the first two terms together and the last two terms together. When I do that, in the first two terms, all I can factor out there is an x. That leaves me with 2x minus 3. For the next two terms there, I see that those are both divisible by negative 4. By the way, remember, whatever this value is, it doesn't matter if it's a minus or plus, that tells you what sign you're going to put there. All right, so we're going to factor out a negative 4. So negative 8 divided by negative 4 is a positive 2x, and 12 divided by negative 4 would be a negative 3. All right, so we see that we have the same thing in parentheses there, the 2x minus 3, and what's left over is x minus 4. So the denominator factors down to be 2x minus 3 and x minus 4. Now the numerator, this is one that's a little bit easier because we have the a value there that's 1. So we're just looking for two numbers that multiply together to be a positive 4 that add together to be a negative 5. Well, that's going to be negative 1 and negative 4. All right, so we have to have it in factored form to find the vertical asymptotes, and here's why. So you see, I see that the x minus 4s cancel out, so those are where we get the holes from. So we'll get to that in just a minute. But what's left over in the denominator? We don't care about the numerator. What we care about is the denominator is a 2x minus 3. So if I set that equal to 0 and solve it, I would add 3 and divide by 2. So I'd end up with x equals 3 halves. So we get that from what's ever left over in the denominator after looking to see if anything cancels out between the numerator and the denominator. Let's look at how to find the holes in the graph. Now the hole is where x would equal 4. But then if we're just finding the coordinate for where the hole would be at, well, that's our, so again, the reason why we get x equals 4 is because that's what cancels out. If we set that equal to 0 and solve it, you get x equals 4. Uh, but then to find the y value, to find the y value of that hole, that's where you're going to put 4 into the original into the equation after we canceled out the 4. So we're going to put 4 in there for x. We'd have 4 minus 1 over 2 times 4 minus 3. Well, 4 minus 1 would be 3. 2 times 4 is 8, 8 minus 3 is 5, so we get 3 fifths. So we'd have a hole where x is 4 and y is 3 fifths. To find the x-intercepts, to find the x-intercepts, that's where you use the numerator. After we simplified, um, it were canceled out the x minus 4, we're left with x minus 1 in the numerator. If we set that equal to 0, 
we get an x-intercept at x equals 1. Or write it as a coordinate, that'd be the coordinate 1, 0. For the y-intercept, for the y-intercept, if we go back to the original equation before we factored it, that's the easiest way to find the y-intercept. Because all you got to do is you put 0 in for x. If I put 0 in for x, I'm left with 4 twelfths. And 4 twelfths reduces to 1 third. So you could say y equals 1 third. I would accept that. Or you could say it's a coordinate 0, 1 third. And then as far as graphing that, we would take all that information. Let me just zoom out a little bit here. We're going to take all that information and put it into a graph. Now we have a lot of things there. Um, we have our horizontal asymptote is at y equals 1 half. So I'm going to, when I count by ones here, I'm going to put some gaps because we're going to have some fractions here. All right, so if we have a horizontal asymptote at y equals 1 half, say that's right about there. Uh, we have a vertical asymptote at 3 halves, which is basically 1.5. So there's our vertical asymptote. And then we have these four quadrants. And so now i got to figure out, well, which four quad or which quadrants is this graph going to be in? And if you remember the parent function for this, it looks something like that. Um, so we know it could be in either these two quadrants or in these two quadrants. But we also have some more information we haven't finished graphing yet here. So we know that we have an x-intercept at 1, 0. We have a y-intercept at 0, 1 third, which would be right about there. So I know one of those branches is going to look like this. Now we also have the uh, hole in the graph is at 4 and 3 fifths. So our x is 4, so 1, 2, 3, 4, and 3 fifths would be above 1 half. And so our graph is going to look something like that. All right, the last thing we need to do is we need to talk about the um, limits and the behavior near the vertical asymptotes as limits. Okay, so let's just uh, focus on that for right now. So if we look at that vertical asymptote at three halves, remember we have two sides. We have a right side and a left side. So the right side, we refer to that in this using this symbol here, saying that three halves to so the plus power is referring to the right side of that vertical asymptote. When we have... The negative here, that's referring to the left side of that asymptote. So you can see on the right side of that asymptote that it's approaching infinity. And we can see that the left side of that asymptote, the graph is going infinitely down. So it's approaching negative infinity. And remember, the horizontal asymptote will give us the end behavior. So when we talk about the end behavior, so the limit as a graph as x approaches infinity, we can see that it's approaching uh, one half there because that's the horizontal asymptote where y is one half and the same thing with the left side of the graph as x approaches negative infinity we can see that that graph is getting closer and closer to one half as well so whatever the horizontal asymptote is that determines the end behavior of the graph and then we also have the behavior of the graph near the asymptote so we have the right and left side of that asymptote um, at three halves. And so on the right side of that, it goes infinitely up. On the left side of that asymptote, it goes infinitely down. All right, so let's look at how we would multiply these. And so in order to multiply these, the first step is to get everything into factored form. And so to do that, we're going to first in that numerator, I see that we could factor out an x. So I'll be left with 3x squared minus 10x plus 8. All right, so now we're going to have to factor that down. My a value isn't 1, so this is another one of those where we have to multiply the 3x squared times 8. I get 24x squared. The middle term is negative 10x. So I'm looking for two numbers that multiply together to be negative, or that multiply together to be 24x squared, that add together to be negative 10x. And that's going to be negative 4x and negative 6x. So now I'm just going to I'm just going to focus right now on that trinomial, factoring that down, we'll get back to that x that's in front here in just a minute. All right, so we'd have 3x squared minus 4x minus 6x plus 8. And then let's group together the first two terms and the last two terms. So from those first two terms, all I can factor out there is an x, leaving us with 3x minus 4. 
In those last two terms, whoops, the last two terms, we see that we have a minus there. It's kind of hard to read with my parentheses, but we have a minus there, so we have to factor that out. And then 6 and 8 are both divisible by 2. So we're going to factor out a 2, leaving us with, if I snake take negative 6 divided by negative 2, that gives me a positive 3, so we have 3x. And 8 divided by negative 2 would be a negative 4. And so then we're left with, we have the 3x minus 4. That's what's in common between those parentheses, leaving us with x minus 2. And then we want to remember to bring down that x. All right, so that's what the numerator factors down to be. So we would have x times 3x minus 4 times x minus 2 in the numerator. Everything else will be a lot easier to factor here. So that other denominator, or that first denominator, what two numbers multiply together to be negative 10, that add together to be uh, positive 3, well, that's going to be 5 and negative 2. Now the other numerator, that's a difference of squares, so that factors down to be x plus 5, x minus 5. Now this one, if you want to change the order, we could say it's the same as negative x squared plus 5x. And I want to factor out then a negative x, and so that way our first term will be positive. If I factor out a negative x, I'll be left with a positive x, and then 5 divided by negative x, that would make this a negative 5. All right, so now remember, you can think of this as one giant fraction where all those factors are in the numerator and all these other factors are in the denominator. So I see now that this x minus 5 and this x minus 5 fact cancel out. So even though these two aren't directly underneath each other with the same fraction, remember we're looking at this as a giant fraction, so yes, they do cancel each other out. And then this x minus 2 and x minus 2, and then this x, now I don't want to forget about that negative, so I'm going to circle it, that x and this x also cancel out. So we're left with 3x minus 4 over negative 1. Whoops. There's a few ways that we could write our answer, so we could leave it like that. We could say that that would be the same as negative times 3x minus 4, or the best way would just be to distribute that negative and say this. But all three of these mean the same thing. All right, so before we go to the next problem, we want to make sure, too, that we list any restrictions. So I forgot, I could have done that earlier, but we're going to go back to our denominators here. And we're going to set each of those factors equal to zero, and those would represent our restrictions, what x can't equal. So from the first factor there, x plus 5, if I set that equal to zero, I get negative 5. Second factor, I'd get positive 2. Now negative x, if I set that equal to zero, that would just be zero. And then x minus 5 there, I already have that one. Um, if I set that equal to, well, no, actually I don't. Um, that would be a positive 5 for that one. So these would be my four restrictions. x couldn't equal negative 5, 2, 0, or positive 5. All right, so here we're going to be dividing. So remember with dividing, we have to remember the keep, change, flip. So we're going to keep the first fraction, change it to multiplication, and then flip the second fraction. Now when I write this down, I'm just going to write this as x minus 4 times x minus 4. It'll help with canceling things out in just a little bit. So I'm going to change this multiplication, and then I'm going to flip this fraction. Now, I'm going to do two things at once. I'm going to flip and factor at the same time. So this x squared plus 6x plus 9, I'm going to factor that, but I'm going to put that in the numerator. So what two numbers multiply together to be 9, that add together to be 6, that be 3 and 3. We have x minus 4 in our denominator. So now we get to the fun part. So remember, this would be one giant fraction. So we can cancel out this x minus 4 with one of the x minus 4s here. We can factor this x, cancel that x plus 3 with one of the x plus 3s there. And we can't do anything else. So we're left with x minus 4 times x plus 3 in the numerator. In the denominator, we have just x. And with restricting, listing the restrictions, again, we look to see what we had in our denominator here. We look at, use those to find our restrictions. So we get that x can't equal 0, negative 3, or positive 4. All right. Let's end by looking at number 42 here. So with number 42, remember to add fractions, we need to have a common denominator. Well, I don't think these look very similar, but let's factor them and see what we can do with these two fractions. So luckily enough, they're both a values of 1. So this is these are those ones where we can just factor very easily by looking to see what two numbers multiply together to be 2. That add together to be 3, well, that's just going to be x plus 1 and x plus 2. This other set, what two numbers multiply together to be 3 that add together to be 4, well, that's going to be x plus 1 and x plus 3. All right, so in order to get a common denominator here, I need to look at these, and I see that in the first denominator we have, or so I'm just going to write this out as a least common denominator. 
I see the first fraction, we have x plus 1 and x plus 2 in our denominator. The second fraction, I see that we already have the x plus 1 represented, so I'm not going to list it again, but we have an x plus 3. So our least common denominator needs to be this. So in that first fraction, what am I missing? I'm missing an x plus 3. So I'm going to multiply the top and bottom by x plus 3. And the second fraction. Now the second fraction, since it's a fraction, I'm going to do this. I'm going to say that this is adding, and I'm going to distribute that negative. So this is the same as negative x plus a negative 5. But in that second fraction, we have an x plus 1 and x plus 3. So we have these two, but we're missing an x plus 2. So I'm going to introduce that to both the numerator and the denominator. All right, so now we're going to end up with a common denominator of x plus 1 times x plus 2 times x plus 3. So that's going to be my denominator. Now in my numerator, I'm going to start by multiplying or just, uh, those two factors together. So x plus 3 times x minus 1. When I do that, I get x squared plus 2x minus 3. And then I'm going to multiply these two factors together. And when I do that, I get negative x squared minus 7x minus 10. And you can do that using the box method. You can do that by foiling, whatever you want to do. And now let's simplify that numerator. So now the nice thing is I see that this x squared and this x squared would cancel each other out. And so we'd have 2x minus 7x. 2x minus 7x is negative 5x. So we're done with those. And negative 3 plus a negative 10, that'd be negative 13. So we have that in our numerator. Our denominator is all these factors. Don't have to worry about multiplying those together. So that would be your answer. Then we just need to list the restrictions. X can equal negative 1, negative 2, or negative 3 because we get those from the denominator. Let's look at number 43. So this, in fact, is the last one uh, for this section. And so to solve this one, we're going to set each of these factors equal to 0. And so that'll give us where our x intercepts are. So that's going to, and I'm going to use a number line here just to help us kind of figure out where the solutions are going to be at. So if I set these equal to 0, I would have negative 2 is one of our x intercepts and positive 4 is another x intercept. And it can be equal to those values. So we would technically use a closed point. Um, and it's equal to because of the greater than or equal to zero, so it could equal to zero, so that we'd have closed circles at those x-intercepts. But anyhow, we want to figure out where are these intervals going to be? Where is it going to be greater than zero? So remember, this is where we use a test point method, where we pick some values for x. Like, let's say if I use a value for x that's less than negative two, like any number less than negative two, like negative three. So if I put negative three in there, remember all we care about is the signs, not the values. So if I put negative 3 in there, negative 3 minus 4, well, that's going to be a negative answer. And negative 3 plus 2, that's going to be a negative answer. And if we multiply a negative times a negative, our answer is going to be positive. So before negative 2 to the left of negative 2, the graph would be positive. Then if I pick a number between negative 2 and 4, like 0 is between negative 2 and 4, but any number would work. Would work. Um, we're going to put 0 minus 4, so 0 minus 4, that would be a negative answer. But 0 plus 2, that would be a positive answer. And a negative times a positive is negative. So between negative 2 and 4, the graph would be negative. And then lastly, pick a number bigger than 4, let's say 5. And if you do that, everything would be positive. So obviously, when you add or multiply them together, you'd get a positive answer. So the graph, to, or, or to find our solution and using interval notation, the graph is going to be positive from negative infinity to negative 2, but negative 2 would be included, because we would be including 0. And then from 4 to infinity, it's also going to be positive. So that would be our solution using interval notation. And that is the end of the section on Chapter 2, Part 2.